Hello everyone. What we're going to talk in uh, this lecture is the second type of biomolecules, which are lipids, which are extremely important for uh, different functions in uh, living organisms, such as energy storage or the formation of the cell membrane and so on. So what we will touch in this lecture, first of all, we will define uh, what lipids are and what are their main functions there. And then we will focus on the main types. I want to stress I will not discuss all the type of lipids found in living organisms, but just on the main ones. So we'll talk about first fatty acids, which are the key component in the formations of phospholipids and triglycerides. And then we'll finish up talking about steroids. In terms of definitions, um, lipids, you'll see structurally, they can be very different from each other and they don't really have a common definition. So in general, they are defined more by their um, behavior in uh, polar and non-polar environments. And so they are defined as a group of biomolecules which are water insoluble, so hydrophobic, and uh, they can dissolve well instead in non-polar solvents such as acetone and chloroform. So practically speaking, what it means is that these will be those biomolecules that you will find in the highest concentration in a non-polar phase. If you take some biological material, you break it down and then you separate the aqueous and non-aqueous phase. So the hydrophilic from the hydrophobic phase, these are the molecules that you find in highest concentration in the non-polar uh, component. Now, why are they non-polar? You see later on when we'll talk about the structure, uh, they're composed mostly by hydrogen and carbon. Hydrogen and carbon do form non-polar covalent bonds and therefore do not um, dissolve well in aqueous solutions. What are the function of lipids? Well, it's very well known that triglycerides are very important for the energy storage. Um, they're one of those long-term type of uh, energy uh, storage molecule. Then they're important for structural. You see when we talk about the cell membrane, how phospholipids are the key component of all, all membranes inside the cell. And finally, also lipids have a very important role in signaling. Uh, many molecules are involved in the uh, immune system, in the inflammation, um, such as prostaglandins, for example. And other molecules are also combined with proteins forming um, lipoproteins, which again, they can be involved in signaling among different cells. Structurally speaking, lipids could be divided into two different groups. And again, I stress structurally. Um, we have open chain compounds, which include glycerides, phospholipids, acosanoids, and some of the waxes, which basically are formed by the der derivatives of fatty acids. You can see some example here on the top right. Um, right here. So this is a triglyceride, for example, which is formed by three fatty acids combined with glycerol. This is one type of waxes, which is formed by a um, fatty acid combined with an alcohol. So sorry, fatty acid combined with an alcohol here on this side. The second type, uh, structurally speaking, um, are the fused ring compounds, which include steroids, and some other waxes which are formed by fatty acid combined instead of linear alcohol to sterols. And so these compounds are all, uh, they all typically contain this structure, this ring structure of carbon and hydrogen, which, and then which is modified by different functional uh, groups. Now, again, I'll stress in this talk, I will not talk about all of these type of lipids, but I will focus only on fatty acids glycerides, phospholipids, and steroids. The reason being that these are the main lipids we will encounter later on throughout the course. So the building blocks of the open chain compound here, these ones, are fatty acids. Now, fatty acids are basically long hydrocarbons, like the one you see here on the right side, which would contain uh, an even number of carbons between 14 and 22 carbons, which at the end, present a carboxyl group. I said at the end, on the last terminal carbon here, there is this carboxyl group. The reason being that the numbering 
of fatty acids always start from the end of the tail. So it will start from here, not from the carboxyl group. Now, the carboxyl group, if you remember when we talked about functional groups, it's a polar acidic group. So this makes this type of molecule acidic, hence the name fatty acids, and it adds some polarity. However, this polarity, the effect on the polarity of carboxyl group is always really lower and lower the longer the chain gets. So in general, these molecules will be not very polar. When it comes to uh, fatty acids, there are two different types. And so the first one are referred to as saturated fatty acids. And these are fatty acids where in the hydrocarbon chains, all the carbons are joined by single bonds. There are no double bonds in here as in this example. Instead, if you find one or more double bonds, you talk about unsaturated fatty acid. The name saturated comes from the number of hydrogen that you can get. So if there are no double bonds, if you think, you have the maximum number of hydrogen you could get with this number of carbons. So it's fully saturated with hydrogen. Whereas if you have one or more double bonds, you will start missing some hydrogen that you could have if they were all single bonds. And so they are unsaturated uh, with hydrogens. Now, if the unsaturated fatty acid, they have only one double bond, they're referred to as monounsaturated fatty acids. If there are more than one, the one here on the bottom, they are referred to as polyunsaturated fatty acids. Now, when it comes to unsaturated fatty acids, just to make it a little bit more complicated, but it's not that complicated, depending on the orientation of the hydrogen in the double bonds, you can talk about either cis unsaturated fatty acid or trans unsaturated fatty acid. I wanna um, be clear, trans unsaturated fatty acids are normally not found in living organisms. They are not produced by living organisms. They are just produced through hydrogenation of oils in industrial processes. So all fatty acid, unsaturated fatty acid that are produced by living organisms will be in cis. However, through ingestion, we tend to ingest also a lot of transunsaturated fatty acids sometimes. So the difference, where is the difference? Is in how the hydrogen in the two carbons involved in the double bonds are oriented. So if they are on the same side, like in this example here, now you will talk about cis unsaturated fatty acid. If they are on the opposite side, and if, as you know, trans, it refers to opposite, like Trans Canada Highway. You're going from one side to the other side of Canada. So the same thing here. So if you have the two hydrogen on opposite sides, now, at this point, you refer to as a transunsaturated fatty acid. This is very important in the overall structure of the molecule, and you can see in this slide. So here on the left side, you have the uh, structure of saturated and unsaturated fatty acid on the top. Saturated, sorry. And on the bottom, two unsaturated fatty acids. A transunsaturated fatty acid here with the two hydrogen on the opposite side, and one cis-unsaturated fatty acid. As you can see, now the trans-unsaturated fatty acid and the saturated fatty acids, these molecules are basically the same thing, just with a space filling model. They actually are basically linear molecules overall. There's a little uh, curve here, but it's basically, they're both basically linear. Whereas if you have a cis type of double bond here, the molecule will have a big, big uh, kink, as we say. These have big, big implication in different ways. So here you can see how the effect of the different uh, fatty acid is in the solid state, for example, of different fats. This table has put together some fats like lard and butter from animals, and here fats from vegetables, such as coconut oil, palm oil, and so on. And here you have information about their composition in terms of fatty. As you can see, um, animal fats, they tend to have a high amount of saturated fatty acids, whereas vegetable fats, with the exception, exception sorry, of coconut and palm oils, they tend to have a lower amount of saturated fatty acid. 
Now, because of these, animal fats, they tend to become solid at room temperature, whereas vegetable fats, they stay liquid. The reason is that, and you can see it well here, is because of the linear structure of saturated and transunsaturated fatty acids as well, now these fatty acids, they can actually compact much better than season saturated fatty acid. So because they can compact much better now, a room temperature where there is very or less energy than in a higher temperature, now this molecule will bind together. The tails, the, all the fatty acid will actually join together, something which is harder to do when you have a kink with a season saturated fatty acid. Now, this has big implication, and that's the reason why, if you think about it, if you look at any nutrition facts where they give you all the information about the different molecules that are found there, important molecules. Now, when it comes to lipids or fats, all they focus on is saturated and trans fats, right? So saturated, this, sorry, saturated here and trans fat here. So only the linear one because they can compact. Why? Because these, the fact that they can compact very well, it's not only relevant to whether of animal fat or vegetable fat is liquid or solid, it has an effect on your health as well. Now, if you have linear fatty acids, so saturated and trans, that can compact better, you have a higher risk overall that this is gonna happen also inside your body as well, including in your blood vessels, particularly in your arteries. And when this happens, you start having accumulation here of fatty acids, saturated and trans unsaturated fatty acid, which over time, they're gonna narrow the, the width of your artery. And in the long run, it can actually cause to trap some blood cells here, which then will block completely your artery here, causing what is called a heart attack. If you're talking about your, your heart, for example, you can have necrosis in other parts of your body. So it's important to understand the difference, chemically speaking, uh, or structurally speaking, the difference between saturated and, and unsaturated fatty acids, cis unsaturated fatty acid, or trans unsaturated fatty acid, and cis unsaturated fatty acid has big repercussions when also to your own health. You saw that the, you'll see that this applies as implication also when it comes to fluidity of the cell membrane, and we'll talk about that in more detail when we talk about the cell membrane. Finishing up here with unsaturated fatty acid, now there is a group which is very famous now, everyone talks about them as their benefit that they have uh, on health and so on. And these are referred to also as uh, essential fatty acid because we tend not to make it, we cannot make them with our body. So what are these fatty acids? These are all cis unsaturated fatty acid, first of all, which are referred to as omega fatty acids. These are very important for different things, for the, your brain function, your growth, uh, to produce anti-inflammatory molecules, such as uh, prostaglandins, which we didn't talk about, for your development, and so on. Why are they called omega-3, omega-6, or omega-9? I'm sure you're familiar with that. Well, it all depends on the location of the cis double bond that they have. So they're naming. So like this one, it's an omega-3. The name comes from the fact that the first double bond, cis double bond that you find in this molecule, so here actually this molecule would turn, the first double bond starts with the carbon-3. As I said at the beginning, the numbering of fatty acids starts from the last carbon of the tail, not from the carboxy group. So this is carbon-1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I'm sure you can count. So if the first double bond, cis double bond, is between carbon three and four, then it will be referred as a, a omega three. If the first one is from carbon six, like in this case, you would talk about an omega six, six cis unsaturated fatty acid. And the same thing if it starts from carbon nine to 10, then it will be an omega nine. Notice one thing that an omega six theoretically will be also an omega nine with an omega six. So that's where the naming come from for this type of cis-unsaturated fatty acids. 
Now, moving on. So uh, fat, fatty acids usually don't exist as a single unit, but they're building blocks of several molecules such as phospholipid and glycerides, this molecule we're talking about right here. So glycerides are defined as esters of fatty acid and glycerol. Glycerol is this molecule you see here on the uh, top right. Glycerol is an alcohol with three hydroxy group. So a three carbon molecule with three hydroxy group, each one of them attached to one different carbon. Now, this hydroxy group react with the carboxyl group of fatty acid forming an ester bond. So a bond, you can see it here, for example, which is mediated by the oxygen. So basically what you would have is that you form an oxygen bridge between this carbon and this carbon, and together with that, you have a formation of a water molecule, a condensation reaction, if you remember. Now, depending on the number of fatty acids you have attached to glycerol, you can have only one, and these will stay as a hydroxy group, or you can have two, or you can have three. Based on that, you talk about monoglycerides, diglycerides, or triglycerides, with the prefix depending on the number of fatty acids. So you can see here again, if you have one, a monoglyceride, two, diglyceride, three, a triglyceride. This slide here shows you how they esterify, uh, how they form the ester bond here. So you can see the interaction between the hydroxy group from glycerol and the uh, carboxy group of the fatty acid. This leads to the formation of one water molecule per bond and an uh, oxygen bridge, which is referred to as an ester bond. Now, Leading to triglycerides, you know, these are very important molecules for energy storage. They're found in your um, uh, tissue, referred to as fat tissue, which is made by adipocytes or adipose cells or fat cells, which basically are nothing else than a huge, 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 huge vesicle uh, containing uh, all fatty acid. Okay, so there were, that was, the, the, the remaining part is just a, a tiny space taken by the nucleus. The rest is all fatty acid, which is found under your derma, in your skin, in different areas, um, or in different parts of the body. And again, triglycerides are made by glycerol, esterified with three different fatty acids, which I want to stress, there can be of different types. They can be saturated or season saturated, or if your diet introduced trans, could be also trans unsaturated fatty acids. So they can be all different types, not always of the same type. This is a picture that shows you more of a model here, a uh, space filling model of the um, triglyceride compared to the, the classical uh, structural model here. You can see basically how the fatty acid here, these will be all saturated. So they are all overall linear um, tails here. And here you would have glycerol present. Now, the next type of molecule, which is very important for biological system, are phospholipids. This is a group of molecules, okay, that have the common properties, which is the following. Basically, they are nothing else than that diglyceride. So you remember a glycerol molecule with two fatty acids. This will be a diglyceride, which on the third hydroxy group of glycerol, it would have, in this case, instead of a fatty acid, it would have a phosphate group. So this is what makes up the backbone, if you want, of all phospholipids. Together with that, attached to the phosphate here, there is always another molecule which can be different depending on the phospholipid that you're talking about. This is a common one found in the uh, cell membrane, which is uh, ethanolamine here. So this is the generic structure of uh, phospholipids. Now, phospholipid that can contain different type of fatty acids. So like in this case, there is a saturated and a season saturated fatty acid. And these are defined as amphipathic molecules. An amphipathic molecule is a molecule that has a clear polar part in a clear polar, no, non-polar, sorry, part here. So in the case of phospholipids, the polar part will correspond to the glycerol, phosphate, and in this case, ethanolamine here. 
uh, phosphate uh, ethanol, uh, ethanol, I should say here. And the non-polar power will correspond to the hydrocarbon tails of the fatty acids. Because of this, when you put this type of molecules in an aqueous environment, this component here cannot dissolve well in water. And so they tend to compact together. The hydrophobic tails here are represented in green in this picture right here. So, and whereas the, the, the round balls you see on the top will correspond to the polar heads of the phospholipid. So each phospholipid would have a round ball and two tails here. As you can see, the polar heads, they tend to cluster together. Whereas the non-polar tails as well, they tend to cluster together in two directions, actually. So they form first one layer, and then there is a second layer of phospholipid, which, if you want, is opposite to the other one. By doing that, why do they form a, a bilayer, not a single layer? The reason being that now, by doing that, they can create a completely hydrophobic environment here where these non-polar tails are very stable. So if you had only one layer and water was here, now they will be very unstable. They will be in contact with water. But by having a phospholipid bilayer, now they are completely insulated from water on one side and on the other side. You see when it comes to cell membrane, there will be the outside of the cell for example, and the cytoplasm inside of the cell here. So the aqueous environment is completely separated through the polar heads from the known um, polar uh, tails in this side. Now, you see when we talk about cell membrane that the type of fatty acid you have here would affect the fluidity. So how well this, how, uh, if you want stable, how well these tails compact together and how much they move around compared to each other. I will talk about that in more detail when we talk about the cell membrane. Last group of molecules or lipids that we we'll talk about are steroids, which unfortunately, as this uh, funny picture says here, they are uh, unfortunately famous for the abuse that is done by some um, athletes in order to um, stimulate the growth of their muscle. In fact, steroids are signaling molecules which are very important to stimulate, for example, growth, hence the growth of muscle cells as well. Unfortunately, they can lead also to cancer as well and heart problems. So what are steroids? Well, this is a group of lipids which all share a common backbone consisting of four carbon rings right here. So three, six carbon rings here and one five carbon rings attached to it. These three rings in the backbone, they're always in the same position compared to each other. So this is the basic backbone of all steroids. The difference between different steroids, and you see in the next slide, is on what is attached to it. So there are different groups that can be attached here, hydroxy group, um, some of them can be turned into a ketone, or there may be methyl groups, and so on, or hydrocarbons attached to it. That's what makes the difference between steroids molecules. Here exactly that's what I was anticipating before, different types or example of different types of uh, steroids. You have cholesterol right here, testosterone, the hormone that makes you grow as a male, and one of the estrogens, one of those uh, hormones that makes you grow as a female, gives you all the uh, physical properties of a female. As you can see, they all share the common structure here of three carbon uh, rings, three six carbon rings, sorry, and one five carbon rings here. And then they have different functional groups attached. Uh, so for example, estradiol, in this case has two hydroxy group, and there are some methyl group here, for example, testosterone would have a ketone in this case, a um, hydroxy group, and uh, two uh, methyl groups here, and so on. Here, there's a long hydrocarbon attached to cholesterol as well. So this gives them also different properties, different function, ultimately, in your body. A subclass of uh, steroids, which are different, are referred to as steroids. So now, these are steroids that would contain, and they all have the backbone modified in carbon-3 with the addition of a 
a polar hydroxy group here. So for example, estradiol and cholesterol are sterols. Okay, testosterone is not a sterol because it doesn't have an hydroxy group here. So why is this important is because some of these molecules now, because of the addition of these um, um, hydroxy groups, sorry, now they become amphipathic, exactly like phospholipids, if you remember. So you start having this molecule, a tiny little polar component here, and a, the rest a big polar component. So the polar, uh, the, they have a polar head, which is completely distinct from the non polar head. Why is this important? You see, when it comes to cholesterol, cholesterol is one of the sterols. Uh, the equivalent in plants are phytosterols. There are different uh, phytosterols there. So this is one of them. As you can see, very similar to cholesterol, but they do not, unlike cholesterol, uh, phytosterols, they do not uh, enter the cell membrane of plants. Cholesterol instead, because of his hemipathic property, so his polar head here and the non-polar components here, can actually easily embed in animal cells membrane where how they embed in there if you remember the cell membranes are phospholipid by layers where you have phospholipids with their polar heads on the outside and the tails the two non-polar tails the fatty acid tails on the side now steroid uh, cholesterol sorry because of the agarose group they can actually enter the membrane and stay with a polar head among the polar heads of the phospholipids and embed their non-polar components here with among the different tails or the fatty acid tails of the phospholipids. By doing that, you'll see when we talk about cell membrane, they actually are able to stabilize the cell membrane in animal cells, um, both at low and high temperature. Something which is very necessary in animal cells, particularly because animal cells do not have a cell wall. In plant cells, there is a cell wall. The stability of the cell membrane is slightly less important. Okay, so the, hence, well, that's why phytosterols do not enter the cell membrane there. In summary, what we talked about in this lecture, we talked, first of all, we define what lipids are, and then we talked about their properties and their functions. Then, I discussed their grouping based on their structure, and then we focus on these main types. We first talked about fatty acids, which are extremely important in the formation of glycerides and phospholipids. So we define the difference between saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. Then we, the, the, we talked about the difference between cis and trans unsaturated fatty acids, and their implication together with saturated fatty acids on the uh, state of different fats and on the health of individuals. And then we talk about this particular subgroup of cis unsaturated fatty acids, which are omega fatty acids, and we define where their naming come from, uh, omega-3, omega-6, omega-9. Then we move to phospholipids. We talked about their structure, their properties, and obviously their function uh, in the uh, formation of cell membranes. We first actually before phospholipid we talked about glycerides focusing particularly on triglycerides and their role in energy storage in the adipose tissue and finally we talked about steroids we define their structures and their function then we focus on the subgroup called sterols focusing particularly on cholesterol and its uh, function and role in stabilizing the cell membrane